Hi, my name is Brenda Hernandez. I will speak to you for approximately an hour. During our hour together, someone somewhere in America will be badly injured, sick, or even dead as a result of a workplace incident. I'm here in this occasion because I want to help in prevent that from happening. To achieve this, we all need your help. Safety in the workplace is important for all employees. OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, is a federal agency whose main objective is to ensure and promote a safe work environment for employees. One of the most important responsibilities employers have to their employees is to provide safe workplaces. This course focuses on the Occupational Safety and Health Act, including its requirement for employers and the manner in which the law is enforced. In the event that workers are hurt on the job, state workers' compensation laws come into play and provide remedies to injured employees. Although workers' compensation statutes are among our very oldest employment laws, they continue to generate legal questions about when employees are entitled or limited to workers' compensation benefits. This course will help employers, supervisors, workers, health and safety committee members, and safety and health personnel in their efforts towards achieving compliance with OSHA standards in the workplace. This course has four main learning objectives. The first one is to understand the Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970, who's covered and the nature of OSHA standards. The second one is to become familiar with the most frequently cited standards and violations in an effort to create awareness so that steps can be taken to find and fix recognized hazards before preventable injuries and illnesses occur. The third learning objective is to describe the elements of workplace safety programs and its recommendations. Lastly, to describe the responsibilities employers have towards workplace injury claims and how the OCH Act should be enforced. Based on the positive experience of employers with existing injury and illness prevention programs, OSHA believes that injury and illness prevention programs provide the foundation for breakthrough changes in the way employers identify and control hazards, leading to a significantly improved workplace health and safety environment. Adoptions of an injury and illness prevention program will result in workers suffering fewer injuries, illnesses, and fatalities. In addition, employers will improve their compliance with existing regulations and will experience many of the financial benefits of a safer and healthier workplace cited in published studies and reports by individual companies, including significant reductions in workers' compensation premiums. What is the Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970? Well, it is a principal federal law requiring private sector employers to keep their workplaces free from hazards that threaten the safety and health of employees. Three new agencies were created by the Congress when the OSH Act was enacted. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration, which is the OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Review Commission, which is the OHRC, and the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, NIOSH. OSHA establishes safety standards to assure safe and healthful working conditions for working men and women by setting and enforcing them 
and by providing training, outreach, education, and assistance. It also conducts inspections of workplaces and provides information to employers and employees about workplace safety and health issues. The OHRC is independent from OSHA and hears appeals of its enforcement actions. The NIOSH provides scientific and technical support to OSHA, helping it to identify hazards and develop appropriate standards. OSHA has overall responsibility for administering and enforcing the Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970. The OSHA Act protects most private sector employees. In addition to some public sector employers and workers in the 50 states and certain territories and jurisdictions under the federal authority. Those jurisdictions include the District of Colombia, Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, American Samoa, Guam, Northern Mariana Islands, Wake Islands, Johnston Island, and the Outer Continental Shelf Lands as defined in the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act. The Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970 allows states that prefer to issue and enforce their own safety and health standards to do so, as long as the state programs are certified by, by OSHA as being at least as effective as the federal program. Another condition for OSHA certification of state plans is that state and local government employees also be covered. About half the states are state plan states. When the OSHA Act runs up against other federal laws affecting the safety and health of private sector employees, example, laws regulating transportation and nuclear plants, OSHA is generally prohibited from exercising its jurisdiction. The OSHA Act is aimed at eliminating, or at least listening, safety and health hazards in the workplace. Unsafe conditions violate the law even if they have not yet resulted in injury, illness, or death. The later might prompt enforcement activities or affect penalties, but unsafe conditions by themselves violate the OSHA Act. 34 states and many nations around the world already require or encourage employers to implement injury and illness prevention programs. The minimum levels of safety that employers are required to provide are defined in two ways, through standards created by OSHA to address specific hazards and through the OSHA Act General Duty Clause. I will begin by explaining the safety standards. At its own initiative or at the request of other parties, for example, NIOCH, OSHA has the authority to create safety standards. Separate standards are issued for general industry, maritime, construction, and agriculture. General industry standards apply to all industries unless more specific maritime, construction, or agricultural standards deal with the same issues. Employers must become aware of and comply with all standards that apply to their operations. However, it is possible to obtain a temporary variance if there is good reason why an employer is unable to comply with a new standard by its effective date and a permanent variance if an employer can show that it uses alternative means that are equally effective in protecting employees. Employers arguing that they should be excused for not meeting standards because compliance will be infeasible must show that compliance with the standard will be impossible or 
render performance of the work impossible, and that they took other steps to protect workers, or that no such steps were available. This slide has, um, has four examples of OSHA's general industry standards. The first one is substances such as lead, benzene, asbestos, bloodborne pathogens, among others. The second one is equipment, such as woodworking machinery, mechanical power presses, arc welding and cutting, pulp, and paper mills. The third one is environmental conditions, such as noise, ventilation, and sanitation. The fourth one is safety practices, such as control of hazardous energy, hazard communication, respirators, eye and face protection, medical services, and first aid. In this example, we can see the nature of OSHA standards by outlining the contents of OSHA's Occupational Noise Exposure Standard. In this standard, it establishes a permissible exposure limit of 90 decibels based on an eight-hour day. When employees are subject to sounds in excess of the permissible exposure limits, employers are to use appropriate feasible engineering. For example, adjustment to equipment to reduce vibration, sound barriers, mufflers, or administrative, such as limitation on work hours, job rotation, or quiet break areas. These are controls to lessen the exposure. Personal protective equipment, such as earplugs, must be used if these measures do not reduce the exposure below the permissible exposure limit. This standard also establishes an action level of 85 decibels based on an eight hour day. A hearing conservation program must be established for all employees exposed to noise above the action level. This includes monitoring workplace noise levels, making audiometric testing available at no cost to employees, taking within six months of employees' first exposure at or above the action level, a baseline audiogram against which subsequent tests can be compared, taking follow-up audiograms on at least an annual basis, and evaluating audiograms for evidence of hearing loss. Hearing protectors must be made available at no cost to employees exposed to noise at or above the action level. Employers must ensure that protectors are worn, give employees a choice among a variety of suitable protectors, provide training in their proper use, and ensure that they fit properly. A training program must be instituted and repeated annually for all employees exposed to noise at or above the action level. Records of exposure monitoring must be retained for two years and be made available on request to employees and to their representatives. Records of individual audiometric tests must be retained for the duration of an employee employment. OSHA maintains a list of the top 10 most frequently cited standards following inspections of work sites to alert employers so they can take steps to find and fix recognized hazards before preventable injuries and illnesses occur. According to OSHA, as of January 5, 2016, the most frequently cited standards include fall protection, hazard communication, scaffolding, respiratory protection, power industrial trucks, 
Lock out, tag out. Ladders, electrical wiring methods, machine guarding, electrical general requirements. As you can see, three of them falls under the constructions category, which are fall protection, scaffolding, and ladders. In this slide, we can see OSHA's 2015 top 10 most frequently cited violations. Becoming familiar with these frequently cited standards and violations will help in alerting everyone so that everyone can take steps to find and fix recognized hazards before preventable injuries and illnesses occur. Among the top 10, uh, we can see that fall protection is the first one, hazard communication is the second one, followed by scaffolding, respiratory protection, lockout, tag out, power industrial trucks, ladders, electrical wiring methods, machine guarding, and finally, electrical general requirements. All of those uh, with a C are construction standards. What safety standards are applicable? In deciding what standards are applicable, more specific standards takes precedence over more general ones. Employees do not actually have to be exposed to the conditions that violated a, sta a standard, nor suffer any harm. It is enough that the nature of their work and the facility make it reasonable to expect that they might encounter the danger. Which are OSHA's elements of a claim? Knowledge of a hazard that violates an OSHA standard can be either actual or constructive. Employers are not expected to be omniscient, but they cannot evade their responsibilities by ignoring obvious problems. Thus, if a hazard is in plain view, is known to supervisors, or is the object of employee complaints, the employer will be deemed to have known of its existence. Because employers are expected to be aware of applicable standards, professing ignorance that particular conditions violate OSHA standards is, is of no avail. To establish violations of a standard, OSHA must show all of the following. First, an applicable standard exists. Second, that the standard was not complied with. Third, that one or more employees were exposed or had access to the hazard. And finally, that the employer knew or should have known of the hazard. Although safety regulations might seem bureaucratic, the potential consequences of failing to adhere to them are sovereign. Employees sometimes engage in careless and unsafe behaviors that lead to accidents. Under the OSH Act, an employer can argue that a safety violation was due to unpreventable employee misconduct. However, to prevail in this argument, the employer must be able to show that it established rules designed to address the hazard, that the rules were communicated to employees, that efforts were made to discover violations, and that people violating the rule were disciplined. In regards to OSHA standards, OSHA has the authority to bypass normal procedures and adopt temporary emergency standards when there is grave danger. From exposure to toxic or other harmful substances or from some new hazard. New standards are initially published in the Federal Register and subsequently included with other OSHA standards in the Code of Federal Regulations. Courts have permitted OSHA 
to require the medical monitoring of employees as a mean of ensuring that they are not being harmed, even where the um, even where there is no current evidence of significant risk. OSHA must conduct extensive risk assessments to justify proposed standards. OSHA must also conduct cost-benefit analysis. In a cost-benefit analysis, the cost to employers of complying with a standard are compared to the economic value of the expected improvement in the work health. For example, few cases of cancer and fewer deaths. Standards are adopted only if they projected if the projected costs do not exceed the projected benefits. Now I'll be talking about the general duty clause. OSHA can develop standards addressing all hazards employees might be exposed to. Therefore, hazardous conditions or practices not covered in the in an OSHA standard might be covered under Section 5A1 of the Occupational Safety and Health Act, which states each employer must furnish to each of his employees' employment and a place of employment which are free from recognized hazards that are causing or are likely to cause death or serious physical harm to to his employees. For example, the general duty clause has sometimes been used to address the problem of ergonomic hazards in the workplace. General duty clause places basic responsibility for workplace safety with employers and can be invoked for enforcement purposes in the absence of specific standards. The violation of the general duty clause. To prove a violation of the general duty clause, OSHA must show all of the following. That a workplace hazard was allowed to exist. That the hazard was or should have been recognized by the employer. That the hazard caused or was likely to cause death or serious physical injury and that feasible means exist to abate the hazard and were not used. Now, what can we do to prevent occupational injuries and illnesses? Employers should engage in proactive efforts to identify and abate unsafe conditions in their workplaces. One of the best ways to do this is to establish an effective workplace safety program. According to OSHA, most successful injury and illness prevention programs include a similar, similar set of common sense elements that focus on finding hazards in the workplace and developing a plan for preventing and controlling those hazards. Each of these key elements are important in ensuring the success of the overall program and the elements are interrelated and interdependent. In other words, they must be used together to create a system of prevention and control. It has been found that effective management of workers' safety and health programs reduces the extent and severity of work-related injuries and illnesses. They also improve employee morality and productivity. They reduce workers' compensation costs. An effective program includes provisions for systematic identification, evaluation, and prevention or control of hazards and goes beyond specific requirements of the law to address all hazards. The elements of workplace safety programs recommended by OSHA are six. The first one is management leadership. The second one is employee participation. The third one 
is hazard identification and assessment. The fourth one is hazard prevention and control. The fifth one is education and training. And lastly, program evaluation and improvement. Now I'll be explaining each of the elements and I'll be starting by management leadership and employee participation. In management leadership, management demonstrates their commitment to improve safety and health, establishes goals and, ob and objectives, and provides adequate resources and support. Management, management commitment and employee involvement are complementary. Employee involvement provides the means through which workers develop and express their own commitment to safety and health protection. In employee participation, management actively involves employee in the program. For example, identifying and reporting hazards and investigating incidents. Employees are encouraged to communicate openly with management and report safety and health concerns. OSHA has a few recommendations for each of the elements of workplace safety programs. The recommended actions for management leadership and employee participation are the following. OSHA recommends to state clearly our worksite safety and health policy to establish and communicate a clear goal and objective for the safety and health program, to provide visible top management involvement in implementing the program, to encourage employee involvement in the program and in decisions that affect their safety and health. For example, inspection of hazards, analysis teams, developing or revising safe work rules, training new hires or co-workers, and assisting in accident investigations. OSHA also recommends to assign and communicate responsibility for all aspects of the program, to provide adequate authority and resources to responsible parties, to hold managers, supervisors, and employees accountable for meeting their responsibilities, and to review program operations at least annually to evaluate, identify deficiencies, and revise as needed. The following two elements previously mentioned are hazard identification and assessment and hazard prevention and control. In hazard identification and assessment, processes and procedures are put in place to continually identify and assess workplace hazards and evaluate risks. Worksite analysis involves a variety of worksite examinations to identify not only existing hazards but also conditions and operations where changes may occur to create hazards. In the hazard prevention and control, here processes and procedures are created and implemented to control workplace hazards. Effective management actively analyzes the work and the work site to anticipate and prevent harmful occurrences. Where feasible, Prevent hazards by effective design of job or job site. Where elimination is not feasible, control hazards to prevent unsafe and unhealthful exposure. Elimination or control must be accomplished in a timely manner. OSHA's recommended actions for hazard identification and assessment and hazard prevention and control so that all hazards are identified are the following. To conduct comprehensive baseline and periodic surveys for safety and health. 
to analyze plant and new facilities, processes, materials, and equipment, to perform routine job hazard analysis, to provide for regular site safety and health inspections. OSHA also recommends to provide a reliable system for employees without fear of reprisal to notify management about apparent hazardous conditions and to receive timely and appropriate responses. To provide for investigation of accidents and near-miss incidents so that their causes and means for prevention, for prevention are identified. To analyze injury and illness trends over time so that patterns with common causes can be identified and prevented. OSHA also recommends to establish procedures for timely correction or control of hazards, including engineering techniques where feasible and appropriate, procedures for safe work which are understood and followed as a result of training, positive reinforcement, correction of unsafe performance, and enforcement, provision of personal protective equipment, and administrative controls. Three additional recommendations are made by OSHA for these two elements of workplace safety programs. And they are to provide for facility and equipment maintenance, to plan and prepare for emergencies. This is training and drills as needed. And finally, to establish a medical program. This is first aid on site, physician and emergency care nearby. As previously mentioned, the last two elements of workplace safety and programs are education and training and program evaluation and improvement. In education and training, all, co all workers are provided with education or training to carry out their part under the program. In addition, all workers are trained in a language and manner they can understand to recognize workplace hazards and trained in the control measures needed to protect themselves and other workers from these hazards. Addresses the safety and health responsibilities of all personnel, whether salaried or hourly. Most effective when incorporated into other trainings about performance requirements and job practices. Complexity depends on size and complexity of work site and nature of hazards. In the program evaluation and improvement, processes are established to monitor the program performance, verify implementation, and identify deficiencies and opportunities for improvement. Employers take necessary actions to improve the program. OSHA also has a few recommended actions for these two elements of workplace safety programs. For education and training and program, program evaluation and improvement, these are the recommended actions. To ensure that all employees understand the hazards to which they may be exposed and how to prevent harm to themselves and others from exposure to these hazards. To ensure that supervisors carry out their safety and health responsibilities, including analyzing the work under their supervision to identify and recognize potential hazards, maintaining physical protections in work areas, reinforcing employee training through continual performance feedback, and if needed, enforcement of safe work practices. And finally, to ensure that managers understand their safety and health responsibilities as described on, under the management commitment and employee involvement element of the guidelines. The common characteristics 
of exemplary workplaces are the use of organized and systematic methods to assign responsibility to managers, supervisors, and employees, to inspect regularly for and control hazards, and to orient and train all employees to eliminate or avoid hazards. There are 10 steps towards an effective training program. These are the followings. The first steps is to determine the training objective. All training programs should seek to modify some employee behavior. Determine exactly what you want your employees to be able to do at the end of the training. The second step is to develop a list of competencies. What must each employee be able to do at a given level of training? The third step is to create a trainee profile. Determine who will be undergoing training. Consider their age, gender, education, learning skills, and so on. Knowing your audience helps determine the language you use, making the training easier to follow. The fourth step is to have the training manager determine an outline of the subject matter to cover based on the competencies and trainee profiles. The fifth step is to expand the outline for completeness and proper sequencing at least once. The next step is to develop training based on the outline. The seventh step is to test the training on experts. Following by testing the training on actual trainees to determine usability, understandability, and effectiveness. The ninth step is to correct the training content based on feedback and reviews. And finally, to evaluate your testing to make sure all questions are good. A question missed by many trainees may indicate the question is poorly written or that the point was not covered well enough in the training. In regards to OSHA trainings, OSHA regulations were expanded to include hazard communication standards which superseded the right to know laws at the state level and required organizations to establish reading hazard communication policy, to replace all state posters with OSHA posters, to establish procedures for obtaining material safety data sheet, which are the MSDS, from manufacturers, to create notebooks containing MSDS and make them accessible to employees, to label hazardous materials and state the effects of such materials, to provide orientation for new employees and ongoing training for other employees, and finally to prepare a safety manual. If an organization is cited for safety violations, safety training might be required to prevent future accidents. OSHA mandated safety training focuses on safety equipment devices, handling of toxic chemicals, safe work habits, and actions to be taken in case of an accident. In addition to OSHA mandated training, some organizations routinely conduct safety training and retraining in order to keep liability insurance premiums at a minimum. Such trainings can help a company become certified as a safe organization. Please keep in mind that safety training is particularly important for production workers. They need training in the following areas. 
in recognizing, avoiding, and preventing unsafe conditions in their job and work areas. Procedures and rules relating to the use, transport, and storage of dangerous machinery, tools, and substances. Rules for the use of protective clothing, systems, and devices for hazardous machinery, tools, and chemicals. And finally, methods of controlling hazards of any type, including the use of a fire extinguisher and other emergency equipment. In an effort to help organizations meet the demands of proper safety training programs, OSHA has developed a voluntary protection program. This program encourages organizations to work in conjunction with OSHA to establish the workplace safety programs I previously talked about. In return, OSHA provides free and confidential consulting services and assists with employee safety training. Participants are then exempt from OSHA inspection concerning the issues raised through the voluntary program. In many occasions, regardless of the safety measures employers and employees take, accidents still happen. It is for this reason that it is important to know how to respond to these workplace injuries. Employers should require that employees report all injuries that occur in the workplace as soon as possible. Reports of injuries should be investigated immediately and truly. Hazards that cause the injuries should be identified and abated. Employers should stay in close contact with injured employees and their medical care providers. Information about job tasks and requirements should be conveyed to medical care providers so they can make accurate assessments about readiness to return to full-time or light-duty work. Light-duty assignments should be available and considered for injured employees who are not yet capable of fulfilling all the duties of their former positions. Employers need to be mindful that employees with work-related injuries might also be entitled to take leave or receive accommodations that will allow them to perform the essential functions of their regular jobs. Now, how is the OSHA Act enforced? The OSHA Act is enforced not only by responding to employee complaints of violations, but also by OSHA going out to workplaces and conducting inspections to determine whether employers are complying with the law. At the same time, enforcement is not effective without the active involvement of employees or their unions bringing hazards to OSHA's attention. Participating in the inspection process and occasionally taking enforcement into their own hands. Employee reports of potential hazards are critical to enforcement. OSHA does not reveal the identities of employees who make safety complaints, but it does inform employers when inspections are prompted by complaints and provides copies of written complaints with names deleted. The OSH Act gives complainants the right to request that their names not be revealed to their employers. When it comes to workers' compensation, employees want to know how does it work. Well, the purpose of the OSH Act is to prevent injuries and illnesses by making workplaces safer. Workers' compensation status deal with the consequences of those workplace injuries and illnesses that nonetheless occur. Workers' compensation is generally provided under state laws. 
the role of the federal government is limited to providing coverage for longshoring employees as well as for its own employees. Workers' compensation status requires coverage of almost all employees, whether full-time or part-time, private or public sector. The major exclusion from coverage is people who perform work as independent contractors. Some states also limit coverage of farm workers and domestics. However, companies that use the employees of contractors to perform work that will normally be performed by their own employees can be deemed statutory employers. If a contractor does not provide workers' compensation for its employees, the statutory employer can be required to provide such coverage. What do employees who are hurt on the job get through workers' compensation? Benefit levels are fixed by law. The benefits include replacement income if an employee is unable to work, payment of all medical costs associated with the injury or illness, and rehabilitation services. Workers' compensation status provides only partial income replacement on the theory that this will give employees greater incentive to, to return to work. Typical payment levels are replacement of two-thirds of normal pay up to an amount that is not more than the statewide average weekly wage. Payments depend on whether the individual is judged to be temporarily or permanently disabled and whether the disability is full or partial. Survivors can receive payments for employee debts. Coverage of medical costs under workers' compensation is separate from any health insurance benefits that an employee receives through her employer. Employees' lives, health, and well-being are at stake in dangerous workplaces. Employees who refuse to work under dangerous conditions have some legal protection for termination or other punishments for the refusal to work. For one thing, walking off the job due to a serious safety problem can constitute protected concerted activity under the National Labor Relations Act. Also, a section of the National Labor Relations Act specifically permits employees to stop work because of abnormal dangerous conditions. It is against the law for an employer to fire, demote, transfer, or retaliate in any way against the worker for filing a complaint or using other OSHA rights. Employers should take employee safety complaints seriously and must not punish employees for refusing to work under conditions that pose a serious and imminent threat to, to their health. The non-retaliation provisions of OSHA have been interpreted as protecting refusals to engage in very dangerous work, and the Supreme Court has concurred with this interpretation. However, such refusals are protected only where the hazard poses a threat of serious injury or death. That threat is too immediate to rely on the normal enforcement process and the employer has been informed but has not corrected the hazard. When an employee has union representation, this representative, never chosen by the employer, must be allowed to participate in the opening conference and to accompany the compliance officer during an inspection. Employees are responsible under OSHA for following health and safety rules. Although employees who fail to do so are not subject to any type of enforcement action. 
The reason is that employers already have available the means of obtaining employee compliance. For example, discipline, training, supervision, among others. If a workplace has unsafe or unhealthful working conditions, workers may want to file a complaint. Often, the best way and fastest way to get a hazard directed is to notify a supervisor or employer. Workers or their representatives may file a complaint online or by phone, mail, email, or fax with the nearest OSHA office and request an inspection. A worker may also ask OSHA not to reveal his or her name. To file a complaint, I have added here um, OSHA's telephone, which is 1-800-321-6742. I have also added OSHA's website and the teletype writer's number. To learn more about OSHA, the law and regulations, record keeping, and the requirements for occupational medical records, or if you have additional questions, please visit OSHA's website at www.osha.gov. Thank you very much for listening to this course. Hopefully, it helped you to better understand the OSHA Act, its standards, violations, claims, elements, and the way the Act is enforced. Let's keep on preventing injuries, illnesses, and deaths in the workplace. At the end of the day, this can only be achieved if we keep working as a team. Thanks again.